Welcome back. This is the second part of the introduction to modern operating systems. The rest of this uh, section uh, will be two things. I'm going to start by revisiting uh, a little bit of what we just talked about. And we will continue to talk a bit about the role that the operating system plays on computers and hardware. And then talk a little bit more in depth about the taxonomy of where operating systems fit and the specific problems that they typically get used to address. And then in the last maybe 10 or 15 minutes, uh, I'm going to flip to something a little bit more practical. And we'll talk about just sort of basic uh, practices around working with a current Linux operating system. So uh, when you end up at a terminal, uh, for many of you, you may not be as familiar with how to get around and, and perform tasks from a Linux command line. That's something that I think we can expect many of the projects and homework assignments uh, will want some familiarity with. So this will be sort of a first glance at some of that to, to start you on the path of uh, gaining familiarity with Linux. So if you remember, uh, we, we started uh, the last video uh, by talking about the operating system uh, and its three roles as a referee as an illusionist and as glue, right? These, these are sort of the three major tasks and, and roles that an, that an operating system is going to be facing. And these problems and these roles are not at all unique to an operating system, right? Uh, and so one way that we can help ourselves to understand these things is to also think about the other domains where these same problems play out. Uh, and so I've got a list of them here, uh, just, just a sample, right? Like there's a lot of places in systems and types of systems where we'll see these same things. We'll see the need for refereeing, we'll see the need for illusion, uh, and we'll see the need to, to connect a bunch of stuff together. <clears throat> uh, and so we can go through these and try and identify those, those different problems. So uh, for instance, uh, the first one we might look at is cloud computing. So cloud computing is something that has gained, um, certainly has become a buzzword in the last decade uh, and is now probably one of the domains that, that the bulk of computation is occurring, right? That, that as much comp computing that's happening uh, in your phone and, and on your computer, there's also a ton of computation that is occurring in data centers around the world, right? So in Google and Microsoft and Apple and uh, Amazon, <clears throat> all of these companies have a set of globally distributed uh, large buildings full of servers. Um, and they will figure out how to schedule tasks uh, across around the world uh, on this large computational resource. Uh, and so the tasks that they're often scheduling there look a little bit different, right? So uh, when you think what is the sort of canonical task that a Google server or an Amazon server is working on. It's different from what would be running on your computer. Your computer is going to be running applications or tasks like watching this video um, or editing a document or browsing the web. The, the computer in the Google data center is performing tasks like uh, generating a machine learning model across a data corpus of you know, millions or billions of images um, training better speech, uh, trying to optimize uh, a large, uh, among like a, all of the different possible products for sale, that would be an Amazon problem. Trying to build the index uh, of the web so that when you search for a specific term, it can more quickly find uh, relevant content. But, but these are in many other ways going to require the same things. We have to run an operating system on these computers that is able to take these different tasks and decide which ones to run at which times. And we need to come up with a controller that gives each task the ability to be written without having to actually re-understand this incredibly complex globally distributed ecosystem. Because if we make every Google programmer have to understand all of that complexity, nothing would ever happen. And so the ability to abstract and present an illusion of something that is understandable and simple is, remains incredibly important in this context. 
The next example um, goes back to our computers, which is we have our operating system, which is uh, sort of balancing between these different tasks, right? My, my video player, my web browser, my, my document editor. But within my web browser, I'm doing exactly the same thing at another level, right? The web browser is showing a bunch of different pages, a bunch of different content. And that content is coming from a, a variety of different remote web publishers, websites. And the browser is responsible for employing a security boundary that switches between these, presents each one with the illusion that it's the only page running, right? So if, if uh, Google is running in a web page. It can't see the other pages that I have open and it doesn't know about them and it shouldn't have to care about them. And so that's an illusion that the operant, that the web browser is creating in the role that an operating system would take. Yeah. So, so we see these same roles of presenting the illusion of isolation and, uh, and being the referee that enforces constraints getting played out in most complex systems. Another example is media players. So uh, Macromedia Flash uh, got used for a bunch of animations that, that were put online. Uh, it's, it's lost some popularity these days, but it yet again took remote content and enforced the illusion of sort of a uniform virtual API that these scriptable movies would be programmed against. Another example that we can look at is databases. So um, you've got a set of uh, large data and there's typically these things called data management systems. Uh, some popular ones include uh, the MySQL system uh, and, and the Oracle database that are both now owned by Oracle. Uh, other ones are the Microsoft SQL Server, uh, PostgreSQL. And then there's smaller ones, like uh, if you're looking at a single machine uh, that needs to manage data rather than um, sort of a dedicated computer. Uh, you might see things like SQLite. And all of these uh, speak an API called SQL, SQL, um, that uh, is a declarative language where you can talk about data that you would like to uh, receive, uh, describing you know, the constraints of what you would like to see or, or update or, or manage. Um, and the database systems deal with a bunch of the same types of problems uh, on the referee and illusionist front. So for instance, one of the properties that we talk about when we talk about databases is something called uh, the ACID properties, A-C-I-D, are four properties that we typically expect from a database. This, this provides the uh, ability for a programmer to interact with a large corpus of data in an expected way. And these properties are atomicity, A, and what that means is that the database uh, operations are atomic. They happen either all at once or not at all. And so when I get a view of the database, I don't see something in flight. I don't see some other user or some other transaction, some other action that's changed the database, only partially applied. It either will have happened or it will not yet have happened. And so I get this ability to serialize and to say, you know, it looks like history happened in this order of operations, rather than potentially the reality, which is concurrently many different things are happening at the same time. And it's the database management, whether that happens on a single server or a database that is actually distributed across multiple servers, that has decided that in order to help programmers and, and systems outside of the database reason about the behavior that it's going to provide. The illusion that it's going to provide is that it will provide this, this process of atomicity or serializability, uh, consistency, that actions happen one at a time and it will provide some schedule uh, at, or, or it will uh, make sure that operations happen in such a way that some schedule could be built that was serialized, that, that these things happen one at a time. So consistency is uh, the C in ACID. I is isolation um, and D is durable, that once something has happened, it won't uh, undo itself later. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in the database uh, version of these same problems, uh, that, that, is often, uh, that is often offered as an entirely separate course. And I'd encourage you to take a databases uh, class uh, to, to see how those play out and the constraints that they uh, you know, 
invoke in terms of how you would actually build a database to, to provide that set of guarantees. Um, <clears throat> so we talked about these large processing tasks that often will happen in cloud computing. Um, cloud computing is the sort of current abstraction and way that we often think about doing these large tasks, but it's certainly not the first and nor will it be the last. One of the other ones that continues to exist uh, and be potentially preferred in, in some cases is parallel applications. And so you can think about this as sort of this legacy of scientific and high performance computation. I've got a fairly specific task and I want it to run in parallel on multiple computers and I want and I have some specific communication pattern um, uh, so, for instance, if I'm modeling uh, weather patterns uh, or other complex physical simulations, uh, I will do some uh, either geographically or physically separated uh, pro portion of that computation on a bunch of different computers, and we'll have specific communication patterns. So I need that application to run sort of in lockstep across all of these different systems. And so how do we actually program that? How do we give the illusion of these other remote computers making sure they stay uh, consistent and at the same space, uh, potentially pausing some things so someone else can catch up. These are, again, um, the abstractions that are going to provide that same uh, illusionist and isolation uh, guarantees that an operating system is, um, but in another domain. And finally, the internet um, is, is probably the, the largest distributed system that we have. We, we have the ability to communicate with other computers that uh, are sort of hostile. They're they're somewhere else. We know very little about them. They might be controlled by a malicious person. Um, and that interaction of the distributed system um, is one where we have to enforce limits. We have to have a um, abstracted and isolated view uh, in order to reason about it. Uh, and so we see much of the same set of problems uh, and, and system approaches and design patterns that we would in an operating system reapplied um, in various forms uh, in the design of the internet. Cool. So we talked <clears throat> near the end of last class about how we would evaluate operating systems. And I, I offered some thoughts there. Uh, and so to, to make that a little bit more concrete, uh, I've, I've written down uh, probably the the typical, maybe some of the most typical ways that, that operating systems are evaluated. So there's this concept of reliability that we often would want. We want our operating system not to crash, uh, our computer not to crash. And there's a couple different ways we might measure or evaluate that. One thing that we can think about is the mean time to failure. So how often, on average, will, will the computer crash? So uh, when I start up the computer, on average, it will stay up for a day a week, a month, before something running on it will crash. That's something I can measure. Another property that you might want is how long it takes to repair or get the computer running again once it has crashed. Um, if I'm thinking about reliability, I want my computer to be up. Uh, I, I want it to not crash very often, but I also want, when it does crash, it to be able to restart quite quickly. Right, so, uh, and this is something where the mean time to repair on many modern computers is quite quick, right? You just turn it off and turn it back on again, and it'll come back up within a minute or two. Um, early computers in the 80s, when it was a mainframe, when something crashed, maybe there were uh, circuit breakers that, that flipped and you had to go find it and start it up again. Maybe the disk ends up being corrupted and you have to do, run a disk repair, and that could take quite a long time depending on the type of disk you have and the file system, that still can be an issue, especially if you've got a large disk. The, the running the file system integrity repairing uh, can itself take order of hours. Suddenly, even though it's a rare occurrence, when it happened, it's very disruptive. And so this is another form that reliability takes. We may want to evaluate our operating system on security, we mentioned that, and also on privacy. And so these are concepts of, uh, how often do we find bugs or the ability for someone malicious to gain access? How well does the operating system steward users' data and prevent data from leaking? Even if it's not a bug, does it intentionally cause that data to end up uh, also being shared with third parties? Uh, how, how well is that in line with users' expectations? There's the concept of portability. 
which talks about how easy it is for this operating system, this code base, which is often very large. Many current operating systems are at least 5 million lines of code. How, how hard is that to bring to a new computer as it is created to new hardware? So how you can measure how long it takes after the hardware is released, um, how much code has to change in order to support a new device. One of the easy ones is performance. So we can think about efficiency. Um, you know, is it most of the time doing user work versus operating system things? And we can potentially measure that in terms of overhead. And so that would be, you know, what percentage of the time is spent in the kernel or in the operating system versus in user work. Um, and so we can imagine a few different specific numbers that I can come up with that track this concept of efficiency and performance. There's also a concept here in performance of fairness. If I've got multiple competing applications, maybe I spend all the time in applications, so I'm very efficient, but it's not very fair. One of those applications gets much more time than others. And so being able to talk about how well different competing applications are treated uh, is a useful part of this performance. Another one would be responsiveness. So when an incoming event happens, so for instance, uh, my web server gets a request from an outside client. How quickly is it able to switch to respond to that event and deliver the response? Right. So again, there's now this balance, which is if I'm more responsive and switch over to the web server very quickly, potentially that means I have to switch more often and so have more overhead, but I'll be more responsive to requests. And so there's a balance there between your ability to uh, respond to events for different programs quickly and how long you'll run each individual program and how, how much overhead you have. Finally, there's, there's this concept of predictability, which is as you run these things, you would really like to be able to predict how the system will behave. So for instance, if I'm uh, running a web server, it may have very little overhead. So it may, it, you know, I've got a very efficient operating system that's, that's just running my server. But once a month, it just pauses everything to garbage collect for an hour or whatever, right? And so in, in things where you care about your real-time responsiveness, um, even if my responsiveness most of the time is great, uh, you know, things happen very quickly, it's that 1% of the time where that background task that's longer runs and suddenly everything pauses for a bit. So, so this was something that, for instance, Android struggled with for quite a while, that occasionally there would be a garbage collection. So occasionally, uh, the memory of old objects, a background process would run through and try and figure out what memory it could recover. And so at unpredictable intervals, your program would slow down a little bit. And so that was uh, you know, a problem for many application developers who wanted the predictability, even if the system overall ran slightly slower, they would prefer that as long as it was very even to being faster most of the time, but at times they couldn't control, suddenly slowing down. And then the final thing that we talked about is that adoption. So maybe, you know, the the final way to say, did this application, this operating system succeed, is are people using it, right? Windows, even if it doesn't have the highest reliability, is a very popular operating system. Uh, and by terms of adoption, certainly, we could evaluate it as a very successful operating system. So hopefully that frames this a little bit in terms of some of the qualities that we're going to be thinking about as we go through and look at the, the, the lower level mechanisms that comprise an operating system. Cool. Um, so I want to leave you with a couple more questions to think about uh, now that I've answered those previous ones. So one is, how should the operating system allocate processing time, right? So if I have multiple competing tasks, we've thought now about a bunch of these performance things and sort of tried to systematize those a little bit. But what's the right answer? If I've got multiple users or multiple tasks coming in, do I give more time to the first person that arrived? Or what if there's a small one? Can I just get it done? Mm. And maybe I don't even know how big a task is at the beginning. If I know when these tasks or when a, a program starts to ask me to do something, how big, how, how long that'll take, 
does that help me even? Or do I just have to have all of them be unknown? Does my scheduling algorithm, the way that I decide what thing to run at any given time, change if I know things like how long it will take um, or how many resources it will take? I have these same questions as an operating system about what my policy is when I'm allocating memory. I'm choosing how much memory or whether I should give memory to a, very, a given program and the file system. So a program asked to write files. Does it help me if I know how much data that program is going to want to write into the file? Maybe that lets me know, oh, I've got a hole in the physical disk. There's a place that I haven't written anything, but it's about a megabyte big. So if you want to write something smaller, then I can give you that. But if you're gonna to want to write something bigger, I should give you a different one that's bigger. Uh, so should we ask programs before they write to tell us how much they're going to write? Does that help? So these are another set of questions that we're now going to be starting to think about in the next couple of lectures uh, is, is some of these policy questions about how an operating system might actually manage these questions. The other thing to think about, um, and this now goes back to, to sort of the, the natural succession uh, from the sort of evolution of the different types of operating systems, is that there's not a single computer, right? And as a result, there's not necessarily going to be a single right or best operating system. So the, the operating system I would want on my desktop or my laptop needs to deal typically with a single user, maybe a few, and many different applications that that one user is running. A smartphone has potentially a slower processor. It certainly only has one user, not potentially a few. Uh, and applications uh, are coming from less trusted uh, sources through app stores, but you know, in Android, um, Android expects that you know applications can come from anywhere. Uh, and, and so you end up with a different set of design constraints. As you go even uh, smaller to embedded systems, you end up with a set of tasks specific uh, operating systems. So when I look at a industrial controller, so the, the computer that is managing a factory or a processing line, uh, or the computer embedded in everyday objects. So there's a processor running in the thermostat that controls the heat for a building or um, in a car, right? It's dealing with something that's much more specific. It probably knows its workload much better at the point that it's being programmed. Um, and, and so there will probably only be a small number of applications and they're known in advance. So the operating system that you might want is probably doing something very different. It probably also has more real-time constraints. So it wants to be more responsive and be able to talk about its responsiveness in terms of uh, something closer to actual milliseconds or, or the, the time in the real world that it's taking for that thing to happen. On the other side from these local computers that are around us, you have servers, the ones running in data centers. They typically are running a single or a small number of applications, but they're in a hostile environment where they're connected to the rest of the world through the internet or through a network connection. And they don't really trust the communications that are happening on that network connection, right? So while my desktop trusts me when I type on it, right? I'm, I'm trusted because I'm there and that input becomes a trusted source. Most of the communication that a server is getting is just coming from someone that it doesn't understand. And so it needs to be programmed in a very different way. And the operating system needs to be programmed very defensively. And so that environment may yield a very different operating system than the local single user uh, machines. Servers have uh, additional constraints often. So you may have the, the physical server actually running a number of virtual machines. So what is a virtual machine? A virtual machine is an operating system that's being run as a program. So you have an overarching operating system. These are often called hypervisors or supervisors, which themselves then run multiple operating systems as if those are the only uh, system running on that machine. And so you'll uh, you know, control a set of additional controllers. Uh, and, and this you know, adds to that complexity of uh, 
the, the virtualization means that, that I'm even more abstract and have less concrete data to work with in terms of figuring out how I would schedule these different virtual machines. All right, so we've got about 20 minutes left, a little less than that. And so what I'm going to switch to for the, the next sort of final section of this lecture um, is some uh, interaction with a, a typical Linux system um, and, and try and improve the familiarity that, that you have in terms of being able to just work with that. Um, I think for many of you, you may have some familiarity with this already, so bear with me, um, but, but hopefully at least some of this is useful. So let me just uh, start by having written down some, some commands uh, that are you know, going to be quite common uh, and, and maybe can be referred to as a reference. So uh, a lot of the paradigm, uh, a lot of the way that you're going to think about interacting with Linux system is the same as with any computer that you're familiar with, um, but we're going to have textual commands that we type instead of these visual graphical user interface metaphors that have evolved. So uh, like opening a folder uh, physically uh, or in, on your graphical machine, uh, when you are uh, in a terminal, so you're, when you are at the text console of a Linux computer, uh, your text console will be in the context of some folder. Uh, and you can see what is in that folder by typing ls. And so ls will show you the files that are in the current folder. Um, and you can add additional flags to change the behavior of a program. They are, the convention is that you use a, a dash or a minus sign and then a, a letter or a set of letters to define the, the flag or the uh, additional argument that you want to make to that program. So. Uh, when I say ls-l, what I'm saying is show me the long form. So ls-long will also give you that. You can see what directory you're in uh, by typing pwd for the present working directory. Um, and you can move around directories by typing cd, change directory, and that's the same one as in DOS. Right? So ls, this first command that lists the files, that would be dir, dir, when you're in a DOS Windows world, it's ls in Linux. If you want to move files from one place to another, rename them, move them between directories, you use MV. So MV, old file name, new file name. If you want to remove a file, you can use RM, remove RM file. To create a new empty file, you can use touch. So touch and a file name will make a new empty file with that file name. If you want to make a new directory, you do MKDIR, make dir. You can learn some information about a file by typing file and then the name, and that'll tell you, is this a data text file? Is this a program? What type of file is this? And then finally, you might want to edit the file. Um, there's a few different text editors that will be accessible to you on a terminal. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit um, as, as we switch over from, from this slide. Um, but the most common ones are uh, VI or, the, or VI Improve, Vim, Nano, uh, and Emacs. So uh, I'll give you a brief demonstration of how to add files in each of those. Um, and one of the things that's maybe most confusing to new uh, Linux users is how do you exit uh, from these different text editors? Uh, so we'll also make sure to cover that. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over now uh, to, to a view of a terminal. Uh, and so give me one second. All right, so this is a terminal that will look somewhat similar to the terminal that you are likely to find. Uh, on any Linux or Mac-like computer. Uh, what you have initially will be a prompt, uh, and that likely will end with a dollar sign or potentially a pound and then a cursor where you can type and we'll see the text appear, right? Um, the prompt often has some information. The specific type of information will change a little bit. Here it's telling me my username the name of the computer that I'm currently using, and the directory that I'm in. So the first uh, command that we can look at is ls. If I type ls or list, I'll see that there's no response. There are no files in the current directory. The current directory we already learned is slash opt slash modern OSs, a directory that I just created for this course. And I can type pwd or present working directory to confirm that, typing it tells me that I am indeed in this folder. 
I can change directory. So I can cd into another directory. Like for instance, the root directory on this computer, cd slash. Slash will be the top of the file system, or the top mounted root directory on a Linux computer. Now when I ls and list, I will see what looks like a fairly general uh, base folder structure in a Linux computer. So there are a bunch of folders here. The folders are in this purple color on this computer. Uh, there are also some links or aliases uh, denoted by this lighter cyan color and the at sign. There's a temp folder that is a spe special folder. It behaves slightly differently uh, and hence has a different background in this. The specific colors and rendering that you'll get will likely be different. I can also get more information about these folders by typing ls-l. The l flag will give me a longer view. And in fact, it tells me quite a bit. Um, so I'm going to scroll up. It starts by telling me a little bit about how big this is. And then it gives me this fairly complex display where it displays each item in the directory, one per line. Uh, it starts by giving me um, the set of uh, flags, which actually tells me the permissions of this directory. Uh, and so these permissions, uh, most of these are read, write, and execute bits that tell me which users are allowed to interact and in what ways with this content. It tells me um, a size, uh, or sorry, it gives me an additional uh, piece of information um, of flags for the thing, uh, for the folder. Uh, it tells me the owner, the user, and the group that owns it. It tells me how big this item is. It tells me when it was last modified, and then it gives me the name. For aliases, things that are linked uh, and are just sort of a pointer, it tells me where they are pointing to. So you can see that some of these have different permissions that, for instance, only the root user can modify this one is what this means. Whereas for most of these others, the, the group and in fact all users are able to look in them. Okay, so we've uh, moved around, we've uh, looked. I'm gonna go back to um, modern OSs. Um, Often you can tab complete, so, you, so I just type the first couple letters MO and type tab to get the rest of this. Um, I can make a new file, so I'm going to touch a file called test.txt. And now when I ls, I'll see that that file has been created in this directory. Uh, and I can ls-l, and I can see that that file was created. It is empty, and it is owned by my user. Um, I can also make a directory, and now when I ls, I should see that new directory in addition to the file that we created. I, if I misname or want to move things around, I can use mv to move. The syntax is I type mv, I type the file, and I type the new file. Um, and if I want to get rid of this file, I can rm the file and that will make it go away. Okay. So I can make items, I can move them around, I can delete them. It's a lot of the life cycle. The final part is I might want to edit them. Um, the first text editor that I'll just give you a very brief explanation about is Nano, just because it's a very simple one and should be, exist on many computers. Um, I'll then also cover VI or Vim, uh, which uh, will likely be installed on any computer where you don't find Nano. Uh, and the syntax may be slightly more confusing. So if I've got a new file that I want to edit, I don't have to necessarily create it before I edit. I can just directly edit it. So I'll type nano to edit a file called test.txt. And this changes my whole screen into this text editor. Um, at the top of the screen, I can see what file I'm editing. And at the bottom, I see some shortcuts that nano provides by default that tell me how do I uh, do things like save, um, replace, or do more advanced operations. But in this text editor, I can just directly type. So I can say, welcome to modern OSs. Uh, and then this uh, caret key uh, is a representation of the control key. So if I type control O, it will attempt to write it out. Uh, it provides me some additional options, like I can 
change how line endings happen, or I can do additional things. In this case, I can just type return or enter to make that file written. Uh, and it has written this file to disk. It kind of tells me that it wrote it. I can then edit, exit or quit this editor by typing control and X. Now I'm back here. And if I look, uh, I'll see that this file exists. I can then type file, which will tell, give me some information. And if I try and say what type of file is test.txt, it'll tell me that it is for ASCII text. I can re-edit this same file by typing nano test.txt again, and I'll see that the same that the content is indeed still there. I'm going to type control X to exit now. Uh, if I want to see the file just directly on my terminal, I can type cat, which will concatenate uh, this file, and it'll print it out directly in line. Okay. So the final thing that I want to do is um, show you how to use Vim. So I'm going to type Vim um, and then test.txt. So I see a similar but somewhat more sparse piece of information. I see uh, the same the contents of the file by default. And it tells me some information about how many lines and how many characters are in this file. I can use my arrow keys uh, to move around uh, and change where my cursor is. By default, in Vim, I'm in a command mode. And so what that means is if you start typing, you will not actually see those characters uh, show up in the file because uh, what you're doing is sending commands to Vim, not uh, writing. So the, the sort of most important first thing to learn is you're going to type the letter I, which moves you into insert mode. Once you're in insert mode, characters that you type will show up Will be written into the file. So I can still use my cursors to move around, so I'm going to move to the end of the line, and then I can hit return and uh, say, I hope so. um, To get out of insert mode, so you've finished writing uh, the contents that you want, you would hit escape, and now you're back in command mode. So you've made a change to your buffer in Vim, you now have two more things that you're going to need to do. You want to be able to save, and you want to be able to quit. So the way that I send these commands to Vim is I start by typing colon. So now I'm uh, essentially going into a command mode where I can uh, do multiple things. Most of the individual letters in Vim are going to be about moving your cursor, uh, deleting words, uh, changing the buffer. So these uh, serve special commands like quitting and uh, saving the file. Are going to be done by first typing colon and then there's two things so colon w is going to write the file so if i say colon w it just wrote it and then colon q is going to quit the program you can also do those together by saying colon wq uh, all as one command which will first write and then quit all right that's all i have for you for the shell uh, and so i'm going to transition back to slides now there's a final thing that I want to uh, do in this lecture, and that is uh, give you a couple of questions to think about and optionally uh, try and write a paragraph about uh, for next lecture. Uh, so you can think of this as sort of a mini homework, and I'll try and do this fairly regularly. The first question uh, is to think about the constraints that maybe a server or uh, a high reliability operating system needs. So if you need to design an extremely reliable operating system, what techniques would you use? What tests would you use to make sure that it's really actually reliable? The second question is, managing resources is a problem very broadly. We talked about it in a computer setting, in an operating system assessment. But what techniques do we use as a society to allocate resources, to isolate misuse, and to foster sharing? So I'll leave you with those two until next time.